Before we get started, why don't you just introduce yourself very briefly, and maybe while you're doing that, talk a little bit about your experience with Cloud Foundry. Hi, so uh, I'm Andy. I work for the Government Digital Service um, in the United Kingdom. Um, we are a central organization within government trying to build services and platforms that help UK government services uh, digitally transform. So um, we run, our organization runs two Cloud Foundry foundations and we deploy a number of uh, SaaS products to those uh, platforms, including some of the ones that I look after. So um, I deploy a number of different Java and Python, et cetera, applications to Cloud Foundry. And uh, those are there to help other government departments do things more easily, not have to procure um, options, and uh, basically transform faster. Yeah, um, I'm an uh, application developer. I do not, I do not operate any part of our Cloud Foundry infrastructure. I annoy the people who do and ask for more capabilities often. Um, so we run hybrid cloud. We've got. Cloud Foundry run an internal and public cloud spread across multi um, availability zones. It's run on top of a, or it's wrapped around what we, our secure DevOps platform called CloudForge. So every interaction we have with Cloud Foundry almost always goes through our pipelines for 5,000 developers spread across four SBUs. Um, most of the applications would be. Java, Spring Boot, um, then single page web apps, moving down into Node, Python runtimes. Um, I'm Yui, and I've been working in the, I work for Pivotal, and I've been working on Cloud Foundry since 2014. Um, first started out uh, on the original runtime team, way back with DAs and HM9000, all of which we've swapped out, and now we're gonna swap it out again. Um, and uh, I've just excited to try to figure out how we can get uh, code to production faster in a safe and sane way. You've been working on this for longer than the foundation exists. Yes, that's right. I remember thinking, oh, we'll see how this foundation thing goes. <laughs> it's been going all right, I think. Yeah. yeah people still show up, so mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, let's pick up from yesterday to get started. Uh, Craig McLucky said he's tired of talking about Kubernetes. and. Um, I'm pretty tired of it. So the logical question is, are you tired of it? Well, I've only ever said one thing in anger about Kubernetes um, to our senior architect of the Secure DevOps platform, and is if I ever get direct access to Kubernetes, that's a failure. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be writing thousands of lines of YAML. Um, you know, when I was at university, um, if you had told me in 10 years' time, um, you'd mostly be writing configuration um, rather than actually writing code for your business, um, I would have probably looked for a different job at the time. Yeah, I don't want to talk about Kubernetes. I don't want to care about it. I just want to write the code and ship it to production. You don't want to write YAML files? I hear it's a lot of fun. No. No? Yeah. I mean, you're really interested in manifest.yaml after that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we've kind of just started on a Kubernetes journey, and um, yeah, I'm like, I've kind of come from Cloud Foundry, and Kubernetes is kind of a newer thing, which I think is maybe somewhat the opposite direction for some people, but um, the ease at which um, we can develop applications and change applications and kind of throw things at the wall, see what sticks with Cloud Foundry is just so much greater that, um, yeah, I, I think Kubernetes promises lots of things, but from a developer perspective, I'm not nearly as interested in those things than the things that Cloud Foundry can bring me. So um, I'm sure for the operators it's going to be wonderful, but from a developer perspective, I'm less interested. So for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm a little tired of it, but you know I get it, right? Like it, it's it's a huge community, it's amazing technology, and I'd like to make it easier for people to use. Right, um, and, and right now, if you have to write 500 lines of YAML that may conflict with someone else's 500 lines of YAML, it's not a lot of fun. Um, and I think it it's, you know, takes away from that time uh, developing code, um, delivering value to, to your customers, to your business. Um, so the, I feel the quicker we can make that disappear under the covers, and really we can just get back to teching, talking about what are the capabilities? What are things operators can benefit from uh, from that technology stack? Or what are the capabilities uh, um, 
developers can take advantage of because the service mesh technology is, is also just disappearing under the covers and you don't have to know about Istio and things like that. Can't wait. Sure, and that in many ways is the promise of Cloud Foundry, right? And that's very much the focus this week. But um, project like Irini, for example, what does it do for you as a developer? Do you, do you even care? No, <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> as long as I uh, still have that experience of like CF push that you know it'll go through our pipelines and then in a couple of minutes it'll be up and running in production and our users can hit it. I don't care what goes on under the hood. I care about the functionality that those different um, between Diego and Kubernetes may give us, but they're just features to me. I don't care what it's running on. You know, in the future, it's going to be something different. And at that point, sure, if the operators decide they want to change over, so I just tell me what I'm going to get um, and make sure it's still that good developer experience. Sure. I think for me, if, if I was running a workload on Kubernetes via Irene, I, the question I'd ask myself is, am I going to use KubeCuttle or am I going to use the CFCLI to look at all these things? And I think I'm still going to use the CFCLI <laughs> because that's the thing I interact with, that's the thing I know, that's the thing I want to use. So like the Irene Diego kind of, um, or Diego Kubernetes argument is like less important to me because I think all of the stuff I care about is through the Cloud Foundry layer. And as you say, it's just a feature kind of unlocking ability that Kubernetes can offer. So. Um, I might be bugging the operators of my platform. Can, like, can you add this stuff or like, bring in these new features? But from a kind of day-to-day -day perspective, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. So. Yeah, I see Jules nodding rather emphatically out there <laughs> that he doesn't want to care about this stuff anymore, but he's still at the forefront of pushing it forward. Sure. Do you think it's a bit of a distraction, actually, for you to have to have all these discussions still ongoing? No, um, no. I, the biggest thing I would want right now is the um, CF3 uh, API, mm -hmm. um, by far. Just the amount of features that I know it contains, but then obviously we've got the secure DevOps platform who need to do work to enable that for us. Like, um, I'm already using them within some applications running in Cloud Foundry, Bootstrap, and other features, but they get that real, the real good pieces of the CF. 3 API, um, there's got to be a lot of work needed to be done on the operator's end and our security DevOps platform, et cetera. But that's the thing I'd be most looking forward to. What are the really good pieces for you that you're looking forward to? Um, it's green-blue deployment pattern at the minute. A lot of people do not like. Um, it's great when it works, but if you get into the issues of staging, um, how your applications are named causes us issues, so you push your green app shows up as green in your logs, even though you just want that nice one name, thing. just small, tiny issues, um, whereas new API, we don't have that issue anymore. You can just CF push and it'll um, close to zero downtime as possible. We're going to get away from saying the word zero, but maybe rolling. Zach's, uh, Zach's going to be demoing some stuff with the V3 API just after this panel. But yeah, I'm really excited for, for us to finally finish um, getting all of the cloud controller things over to v3, roll out these new deployment strategies so that if you can see a push and see a push again and no downtime, um, you don't get that downtime from staging and something might go wrong over there. Um, it's just baked into the platform and um, it's just that, that much less that you have to, to care about. For sure. We're a little bit further down the road where we've picked up v3 quite heavily already. Um, we're not, we don't have to run behind any platform. We get access to all of our spaces via the CFCLI. And so we're starting to see the benefits of those things and things like uh, the network policies being persistent when you use v3. So being able to build proper microservices meshes that, um, yeah, we're releasing those benefits already. So it's worth it when you get there. What else are you, are you looking for from, you've got the whole community here um, as developers, and we're talking so much about the developer experience, but what, what do you want from the project to make your life easier as a developer on top of Cloud Foundry? Well, I think I know what's coming, but uh, fine grained access through the CLI, um, big insurance company. There's a lot of uh, auditing um, needs to be done so we don't get CLI access outside of our development spaces. Um, 
you know, we don't want anyone just going in and being able to delete production applications, and then the rules that do allow it are too, they're too big. Um, they would still be too much for most people. As me, an application developer, I could potentially go in and just wipe out an entire department's applications. Um, so more fine-grained access if I want to scale up applications or I just want to get in and maybe just push a user-provided service out um, but not delete them. Those sort of things I love. Um, I hate having to go through pipelines and bamboo and stuff just to be able to push a new user-provided service out or fix something in production sure. and just redeploy it. But you work for a giant insurance company with nothing is ever easy, I'm guessing. So. Uh, no, nothing's ever easy. I mean, our entire stack ranges from mainframes right through to serverless workloads on Azure and AWS. You know, there's a complete polygon of runtimes. Mm -hmm. And then all the interactions between all those systems as well come into play. Sure. Yeah. Yuri, you've probably worked on some of that. Yes. It's probably the number one requested feature um, that I hear about from customers constantly about how to um, have more granular access controls. Right now, space developer, it's amazing um, in that you can push your application, get a route, create service instances, bind service instances. But for, for larger enterprises, um, the, they want to um, have separation of concerns and uh, restrict access in production in certain ways. So they might be OK with you restarting the app or scaling the app to two, but they don't want you to change the, the application bits because that has to be under control in specific ways. So that's one of the most common ones. And I'm, uh, one of the, the goals of V3 is actually to try to get some of the, the permission logic into a more sensible state so that we can go ta tackle the, the fine-grained access. Right, right now in the V2 API, it's a little bit of, are you a cloud controller admin over here? Are you a space developer over there? And it's just impossible to try to uh, sensibly put uh, fine-grained access control over that. Are you suffering from the same problems? Or? Um, less so. So we, we work in a quite much smaller teams, um, like our whole organization has um, maybe 200 developers. Um, and uh, we have like strict security checks around people. So we, we're quite trusted with, with access to things. Um, right. Yeah. So you can get security clearances for everyone. Then you can go at it in production. Yeah, if, if you'd asked me what I wanted like six to nine months ago, I probably would have listed quite a few of the V3 features, like the internal networking and the, um, the zero downtime deployments, wrong deployments kind of stuff. So like, that's been really good. Um, now what I'd like is as the model of an application and how to deploy things gets slightly more complicated, you can still CF push, but there's now ways to break down package creation, droplet creation. I'd like to see the community kind of um, come up with some best practices and example pipelines and things like this for how, how to create a package, how to test it properly, how to promote it through environments and things like this. Because there are, like what I'm finding is there's hundreds of thousands, probably millions of applications deployed onto cloud foundries, but there seems to be not that much information about how is best to do it. Um, and so we've seen stuff like um, Autopilot and the blue-green plugin, and this, these blue-green techniques are kind of starting to go, like, there's a few documentation about them, but there's basically a variety of ways to deploy stuff, and it would be nice if there was, like, a, we think you should do this and this and this, or based on our experience deploying 10,000 applications in a huge enterprise organization, we think you should be doing this. So a bit more kind of best practice stuff, especially around deployments, hmm. would be really nice. Is that something that's in the works or being discussed? I think it, it, what I've seen that at companies, but, but that sounds amazing, um, somehow figuring out how to consolidate um, these pipelines and these opinions and document them so that not everyone has to stub their toes so much. Uh, I, I think, you know, my hope is we can encode the 80% of that into the platform, but the 20% the where you still need to figure out or you want to granularly control something so you can run some specific tests or run specific scanning after, after that and in, encode how can you do that um, nicely and have that in a shared place. That sounds, sounds really great. I feel like you could probably, if you have them, put them up in the Cloud Foundry community. Dr. Nick over there would be happy to give you access. He's giving a thumbs up to, to host some of those pipelines if you wish over there. But, 
But yeah, that's if you were looking good. for extra work, now you got it. So. <laughs> well, all of the stuff that we do is open source anyway. So if you go to like GitHub slash AlphaGov, you can see all of the way that like both our Cloud Foundry deployment and the stuff we deploy in Cloud Foundry. So you might see it pop up there. I'll come in Slack and shout about it. Oh, I'll just think. throw my de security DevOps team under the bus and say they um, can happily talk about how they handle all our pipelines. I would say with our pipelines, one of the things you lose is a lot of the what's on there, all the cool things you can do um, because it's going through pipelines, it's using Bamboo plugins, etc. You know, something I've been wanting is CLI access within the pipelines, um, and we're getting closer to, closer to that point, but it's just not there yet, and I feel like a lot of developers don't realize the power of what they could do if they had just direct access or were able to script it as part of the pipeline. Sure. Yeah. Sure. There's a lot of trade-offs in that, in that pipeline will get you to, your code to production, but... I mean, I do, I do really like our pipelines. If I had my laptop here, I know I could build a simple Spring Boot app and get it out to production in fi five minutes or less. Um, most of that time, just being waiting for the, the build and deploys to go. But do feel like getting into more complex scenarios. Um, you, you want to need that CLI access, otherwise you're going to start looking at other um, platforms or different runtimes or different IaaS solutions. Sure. For us, I think that's like one of the really nice things about Cloud Foundry is that we have pipelines and like we use GitOps like wherever possible. But in the situation where a developer wants to try something on a pre-prod environment or test something out, like the pipeline is not doing such a huge complicated thing that it's impossible to re recreate locally, and they end up just kind of merging testing changes and things like this. They can just do it from their machine and. Um, like as long as they get relevant permissions in those spaces, they can do that. And so I think that's one of the things that allows like the development cycle to be so short is the fact that they can push to a real Cloud Foundry, they, they don't have to worry about local dev environments, and they can try stuff, see if it works. If it works, then merge it in and use the pipeline to deploy it through the proper stages. Um, so like as I say, we're quite lucky we have access to, to this CFCLI and things like that, but um, the fact that the pipelines are generally very short I think is, is one of the huge benefits of Cloud Foundry because you can just do it yourself locally. Now, when we were prepping for this, um, you mentioned that sometimes there's too much magic in Cloud Foundry. Yeah. It's too easy, is what you said. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, I, was, I was literally thinking about this this morning. Should I mention it again? Um, well, I brought it up for you, so. <laughs> it's a bit of an unfair criticism because Cloud Foundry does aim to have that really good developer experience, but. Um, I've seen people will just throw services out constantly and not think about the overhead and the amount of ops needed to support those services once they're out there, or they'll cheese around architectures and stuff just by adding, let's add more instances, add more instances, you know, keep it going without looking at the root cause of the problems. Um, so there's that part of it. And then when stuff does start to slightly go wrong, some developers are at a loss because, you know, developers don't read documentation. That's the absolute last thing developers do. <laughs> so. Stack Overflow. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's on Stack Overflow, the world's greatest um, resource. But it, it is stuff like the Session Affinity. Um, the NatJ Session ID and VCAP ID is a cookie to the front end to allow that routing back. And one of our uh, security architects was just gobsmacked that it was J Session ID needed. He was writing a node app, and he was like, why am I having to put J Session ID in here? Um, I don't understand. It's, but it's all there in the documentation, but it is when you start to get into that. We had issues with build packs. Um, I'd still say most developers have no idea what goes on in the build pack and what it's for. All, all ours are offline, again, auditing and compliance reasons. You know, you just can't upgrade a tiny part of it. You need to wait until we push, our, our teams push the latest versions of the build packs, et cetera. So when you, get, when you start going outside the pretty large happy path road and you just need to go off-road a bit, it starts, there's just, it's that level of abstraction. Um, having the hooks into it, it's, to me it's like Spring, you know, Spring boots opinionated, but you can go in and just, you could write it all and override stuff left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. so. that, that's, where, like, that's why I think one of the reasons that I want best practices is that it is so easy that occasionally you can make mistakes and maybe do stuff that isn't maybe the best, the best way to do it. So that's where I think hopefully some like, best practice and guidance might help people avoid making uh, some of those pitfalls because the fact that you can basically just push anything and it works um, sometimes <laughs> uh, leads you to do kind of less than optimal things. But um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely better than the alternative of pushing something that does work but 
is like a Rube Goldberg machine of like various like container orchestration platforms. So uh, yeah, the lesser of two evils. But as I say, like I think guidance can really help, and like best practices and uh, kind of lessons learned from organizations doing like really big deployments on these things. And like, uh, well, we deploy maybe a hundred apps. Like there are organizations deploying a hundred thousand apps, and so the problems they encounter, the solutions they've come up with, would be really interesting to find out. I think. Yeah, I've seen some companies create advisory boards um, for for um, for teams, and um, they'll they'll talk about it. It's almost like marketing for each of the platforms. So so some customers might just have a containers platform run by a group and um, Cloud Foundry run by a group, and they'll the the app team will go up to them and say, "Well, we're looking to do this," and then they'll advertise, "Well, we can provide you this." Over here with Cloud Foundry, or could provide you this over on, on Kate's, and here's like some pitfalls and examples, and um, here's our, our templated repo of things, and and they get to choose, right? The the trade-offs, like okay, you get a little more options, you also get a lot more YAML, that's your problem, um, but and but maybe you can solve your problem over there, or less YAML, um, and it's a little bit more magical. Uh, and hopefully that'll, and uh, uh, not to say that, that we, we couldn't be more um, intuitive in certain ways. Yeah, I mean, for most of the workloads that I've seen, um, PCF um, is perfect for the job. Um, obviously, there is some teams do like, other teams do like Docker, so other departments um, lean towards Docker containers. Um, my own department and PCF grew out of this department as far as I'm aware. Um, Again, other teams like full serverless workloads for the it's use case by use case. Sure. Uh, kind of what you're, you're talking about, too, is that it's, you, you have to train your developers to use this despite it being, being easy, right? What's, what's that process been like for, for your teams? So for us, um, very minimal training um, to the point where we find um, we have a centralized reliability engineering team, and the teams that deploy on top of Cloud Foundry need very, very little assistance and very light touch, and they generally look after like their infrastructure themselves. Obviously, we have a platform team running Cloud Foundry, but largely the, the application developers look after it themselves. So it's, um, it's been quite easy for us. Um, it's, it required a bit of training. You obviously need to know a bit about Cloud Foundry and how it works and things like that. But um, it's a point that we've never really got to with any of the other infrastructure platforms that we've that we've built stuff on top of. So um, for us, like in reliability engineering, it's like it's a wonderful thing because um, we're really light touch. We come in for the interesting problems, which is like always a nice situation to be in. Uh, but the day to day is in entirely managed by them. So sure. Yeah, it's very much the same. Um, I can't remember the last time I sat down and talked through how Cloud Foundry does deployments. And yeah, it's, people just take a look at someone else's repo for the most part and go, oh, and build pipelines all set up, do it, push it, drumming. Um, some teams use Pivotal's App Manager. I'm not a big fan of it, but. Um, I'd just why, go, why are you not a big fan of it? I, I just try to use CLI. A lot of them go into it for the logs and stuff. Did somebody it. give this man a CLI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it, like for all the teams we have, I don't hear complaints about you know getting a new service, new team set up. It's all, it is all very intuitive. Um, we do have a large community as well to help people. And yeah, and as Andy says, I like getting involved with other stuff and other teams and stuff, and you help with the interest and problems, um, especially around security and securing SPAs and stuff. And that's when we, we start seeing um, more fun things like this is where the session affinity issue came from, was just mm -hmm. session stumping because we cookies being passed from the wrong app. That feels very affirming, though, that, that it's not so much. And hopefully we can bring this to, to more, more uh, developers out there. Now, developers always love to chase the uh, shiny new thing. We've got a few seconds left here, but, but what are you chasing? What, what do you want? And you're not allowed to say CLI, but <laughs> yeah, it has to be something cool like, like serverless or functions. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have asked about uh, Puddle Function Service, but I would like to see a Graal VM build pack. 
I, I'm like playing manifest golf. Like, how short can I get my manifest and do everything? Like, the processes and the sidecar stuff has like allowed me to just like massively shrink the amount of like wrapper scripts and stuff I deploy. So, um, less code, I think, it, like less infrastructure code, I think, is what I'm chasing. So, all right. Are you chasing something? N not, not so much shiny, but just. You know, if we can get everyone to upgrade their apps to CF Linux FS3, that would make me feel very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll leave it, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Let's all upgrade your, your apps, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.